and welcome to Big Ideas. I'm your host, Dan Seed. This month, we're joined by Hank Hemsoth. As a member of the Christopher Cross Group, Hank is a five-time Grammy winner as well as an Academy Award winner, and we'll certainly get into that experience with him during our interview. And professionally, he's done virtually it all. He's played more than 10,000 international, national, state, and regional performances across genres ranging from classical to jazz to pop rock, Broadway, film score, symphony, you name it. He has done it. Hank, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Dan. So I absolutely love interviewing folks like yourself. And the reason is people like you are just so darn talented. And it really amazes me, especially somebody with zero musical ability. And as my wife would tell you, as somebody with no rhythm, like I'm just in <laughs> awe of what somebody like yourself does. Let's start kind of at the beginning here. Briefly walk us through some of your musical talents and how did it all start for you? Wow. Well, my earliest memories are playing piano at the age of three. I was so small, I could stand on the piano pedals and my nose was only at the edge of the white keys and I would see this sea of keys down both ways. I could barely reach the black keys. And my hand, when I sat on the bench, my feet would dangle off the bottom. So my dad ended up telling me that I was reading music before I was really reading English. So in that sense, music has been my primary language. It's hard for me to say this anymore, but I've been playing piano 63 years. Well, actually 67 now. So I keep adding on more years ago and I can't <laughs> believe that. But my earliest memories are that. And that's all I did through high school. I played in a couple bands and rock bands and went through a classical training at UT in classical piano. I played the whole repertoire, Beethoven, Bach, Chopin, all of that. I got to a point though, where it wasn't what I really wanted to do. I wanted to do something where I was, it was my own ideas. And I also never got to play much with people. So the classical world, you practice for a year and come out and play two concerts or something. Whereas if you play jazz, you're playing with bands and you're playing, I used to play six nights a week, two gigs a night. That's where those 10,000 gigs show up. That was something I, I really much wanted to do. But at the time I was reading music and I couldn't improvise. So it really bothered me that I felt like I could play almost anything. But when I heard jazz pianists like uh, Bill Evans or Herbie Hancock or Chick Corea, that wasn't written, how could you do that? You know. So I ended up get looking for some books. And if you look for jazz books, there's thousands of them and they're all bad and they're all dead ends. And so the real thing to do was to do something about it. And I went to Eastman School of Music and studied jazz and also studied with Dan Hurley at uh, used to be University of North Texas or North Texas University. I don't know. They changed their name. It's called UNT now. And so when I got back from that kind of study, I really plunged into seeing whatever I could do as a freelance musician. <laughs> I ended up doing a lot of gigs all over the place. You know, I, I worked with the Austin Choral Union. I was an acoustic engineer. I've got this huge list of 50 years of things. I had my own company, the Music Design Group. I owned my own publishing company. And I got connected with all kinds of recording studios and just gigs, all kinds of things. I did Broadway shows. I tuned pianos at UT. So there, So all kinds of different kinds of jobs. Because I was just looking, if something had 5% to do with music, I was going to be all in just so I could make a living as a freelance musician. So what do you love about it? H having done all that and had your hands in so many aspects of the business, what, what continues to draw you to it and has throughout the years? It's creative. I mean, you start out as a jazz improviser, you never do the same thing twice. And it's creative. It's on the spur of the moment. It keeps you alive to this very day. I mean, I just spent the last two months writing five new tunes for a new band I'm in that I can't wait to play with them. I wake up <laughs> in the middle of the night and first thing in the morning, the first thing I want to do is either write something, get something recorded, practice something, learn some music from somebody else. So it's an ongoing process in it every day. It's exactly what I want to do. The things that get in the way are... Uh, <laughs> you know, food, breakfast, family, you know, but I love, I love my family too, but 
but they know that some things are primary to me. What is it like in those moments? You know, we hear the stories about musicians all the time. They're sound asleep and then they have that aha moment. Paul McCartney famously had that with yesterday. What is that like when that inspiration strikes you in that moment? What goes through your mind? What's that feeling like? Well, I wish I could say that happens often. I could, I really think that only happened to me once and maybe only once for Paul McCartney. I woke up in the middle of the night and had a complete picture of a tune. And I said, I got to write this down right now or it's going to be gone. Because a lot of stuff, if you don't get it down, is gone forever. But in general, it's more like a research thing and you have a goal in mind and you research what you want to work on. I may have mentioned to you about 12 years ago, I was just doing things like writing and performing, but a Texas State feature writer for the Hill Views magazine, writer Billy London Gray contacted me and she was writing a story about the myths around inspiration and creativity. Her article was much more about how research inspires creativity. And I'm all aboard that. It, it, she was the first time to make me look objectively at what I was doing. And I think that kind of spurred me on over the past 10 years to treat research as its own entity, because I had never done it except in connection to be a composer or a performer. And now all of a sudden, I, Texas State sent me through a week of uh, learning how to write grants. And after that, I started applying for grants and getting research grants. And it's been a, a great addition. Does that and make it, sense? Because to me, the inspiration is to, is to have something coming from inside you that's part of you that spurs you on to get started. But then in order to finish it, you've got to have the, the research capability to follow through on it. And I've always looked for things that I'm very related to, or there's a backstory to. For instance, I wrote a piece called, well, two pieces, two desert dances about 12 years ago. And it's all about New Mexico. And it's just because I love New Mexico and I've hiked all over there and done everything you could possibly do in New Mexico. And on the basis of that, I wrote, wrote this piece. But that just got me started because then everything after that was, how do I put this together? All of the, the nuts and bolts of putting a composition together. And we're definitely going to get into your research because you have some fascinating, fascinating research that you've done, particularly in the last couple of years. And when we talk about music and you talk about this research providing inspiration, surely you have musical musicians that, that you look at as inspirations. Who are some of those folks that, that you point to and say, these are my people? So I've got a big background of all kinds of players. I mean, I listen to, <laughs> well, I listen to Van Halen too, but I listen to Rachmaninoff and uh, all the great classical piano players. But then once I heard Bill Evans, a uh, jazz pianist, and also every, all the jazz players that improvise, because you can always learn from a saxophonist or from Miles Davis on trumpet or whatever. So all of those people have, have uh, something you really admire and you want to learn about. And as me, as a, as a working musician, in order to learn something like that, I would train. Here's the research part of it. You love it. I tell my students, I call it ear candy. It's something that just sticks out and you go, wow, that's really cool. And at first it's like magic, but if you analyze it and transcribe it and write it out, you understand how it works. That's the scientific method. And you practice that. And then eventually, gradually, that becomes a, a part of how you play or part of your improvisation. And before we move on, I touched on this in the introduction that you were a part of the Christopher Cross group and those awards um, that the group earned in the early 1980s. I know that from reading about you that, that you and Christopher were friends at a young age. What was that like? Walk us through that, that just coming into music, into the business like that and getting into a group like that and then getting into the point where you're getting into some heady stuff, helping with movies and, and the group itself and his people collaborating and all that. What, is, what was that experience like? Sure. So Christopher Cross, his, well, I don't need to tell you his real name, but we were in high school together and we did things like classical gas duets 
and if that if you even remember that tune sure yes 66 67 or something you're not that old no, so. I, I know i know it i don't remember <laughs> i i remember it but i i yeah i'm not that old but okay i do so, remember it i know so it. Yeah. we're in a, a copy band called flash which was like the hottest band in san antonio and played all over played frat parties and played uh just all over and so but i when i went to school Christopher didn't, and he kept playing. And for about 10 years, we were uh, out of touch. And then in the late 70s, I got a call from his manager, and he said, look, Chris remembers you come and audition because he's got a record deal with Warner Brothers. So I don't know how many people auditioned, but what, what I knew, and I was already a skilled musician, I knew I needed to be prepared for that. And so I got a pre-release copy of all of his albums and wrote out all the, the piano parts and had them down, locked down exactly like the record. And when I went to the audition, I played like the string intro to Sailing and they all went, how the heck did you do that? I said, well, I wrote it out and I instantly got hired. And anyway, Chris and I were buddies. So that was, that's the way we got started. And <laughs> I remember the first year nobody had won any awards we were driving around the tri-state area in station wagons and playing whatever and then all of a sudden like i don't know that he got a grammy yet but he was getting airplay and sailing and ride like the all of his big hits were on the radio so all of a sudden we we're like doing uh trips on planes to gigs and opening for acts and the next step was we were on first class tickets going places and it eventually ended up being like Lear jets and limousines picking us up and we were we were on tour with Fleetwood Mac on the Tusk tour for a year all over the world and then another year tour we were the opening act for the Eagles on their last album the long run tour and that was like the the top of being pop stars you know we stayed in five star hotels and everything so we were in LA a lot and there was recording sessions and everything was done there. Then uh, someone approached Chris to write, to co-write the theme to Arthur, the original one with Dudley Moore. And he and uh, Bert Backrack co-wrote The Best That You Can Be and that brought the Academy Award. So that was a big time, you know? And then uh, uh, all of a sudden it all went to nothing because Chris's next album didn't do well. And there was just a spiral down and I, I moved on from there. But Chris is still around and he's still doing very well. And we stay in touch. And eventually uh, you transitioned to academia and you've been at Texas State now for how long? Almost 25 years. But you and I are both called professors of practice. And that's a different term. It's a little rare. That means, well, I, I don't know about you, but I was invited to teach based on my lifetime of real life experience and, mm. and skills. And they didn't look at my academic records. It was just recording chops. And I think what they want you to do is provide students what it, real life experiences so they can do that themselves. Who's the guy at UT? Uh, Matthew McConaughey is also a professor of practice. So that's a kind of a unique thing. It's not tenured, but it, they, I've been here 25 years. So that's what you, me, McConaughey have in common. That's that I have McConaughey's picture, a signed picture of him in our house. My wife is a huge fan. So now I've got that in common too, which is always, always good. Good deal. When, when you work with students, right, with the background that you have, what do you bring to them and what do they bring to you? Because it really truly is a two-way street when you're teaching, you learn things from your students, I would imagine. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, I'm an old guy. So they're always, I'm always remembering things from what I learned at about their age. And I miss the, some of the new players. So people bring me a recording or something and I'll listen to it and go, wow, that's pretty cool. Let's transcribe that, analyze it and understand it the same way I do with anybody else. What can we get from this so that we can apply it to you? So we do that quite a bit. Although the other flip side of that is that these current students don't remember Miles Davis or Charlie Parker or Thelonious Monk. So it's my job to say, look, there's some great stuff here 
you need to not just listen to the past 10 years. Let's go back 50 years and listen to these guys and see if you can pick something up. Because uh, there's the bebop style, which is a great way to learn all kinds of things about improvisation. And so some of these guys come in and all they want to do is like funky jazz or rock jazz. And I'm saying, look, if you want to be a really rounded jazz musician, we've got to learn a lot of styles. Let's get started. And then also for the composition students, it's the same kind of thing. I've got tons of material that I share with them, exercises to broaden their experiences. They may come in and be really good at one thing. And what I want to do is have them be really good at 10 things. And so in that experience with students, there's, I hate to say this or, or put it this way, but increasingly there's a stigma about music education that it's a nice to have, it's, it's there. And if we can get to it, fantastic. But for you as a musician, a professional musician, as an educator, what is the value in music education, not just at the college level, but really across the board, starting when kids are young? Well, how many studies have there been where listening to Mozart is supposed to help you be more intelligent about things? Having any I, kind I listen of... to it when I grade. I'll, I'll be honest yeah. with it. It's calming. It's inspirational. It keeps you on me on track. It's something that's there in the background, but it's something that influences, gets my brain moving to, mm -hmm. to that point. Yeah. Right. So there's that nonverbal part of our brains that's all about music and what comes in your ears. So if you can train that part of you, that broadens your perception of all kinds of things in the world, I think. And we are again talking to Associate Professor of Practice Hank Hemsoth from the School of Music. And Hank, you touched on your research. That's been a big component of what we've discussed and obviously a big component of what you do at Texas State. So some of the research that you've discussed to this point, research is a big component of what you do, obviously. But recently in 2020, just before the pandemic hit, you had the opportunity to go to Rutgers and work there and do research there. Fill us in on that. You found some really interesting stuff, including recordings from Miles Davis, Jerry Goldsmith, things that now you're able to look at, bring to the forefront for the music community. Mm -hmm. Right. So let's just back up a couple of years before that, because I got a National Endowment for the Arts Special Grant Award to do interviews with Dan Morgenstern, who's a National Endowment for the Art Jazz Master. And he's in his 90s, and he was the director of the Institute for Jazz Studies at Rutgers. So there's that connection to begin with. So I, I did a, a huge website on him because he was friends with all the famous jazz musicians since the 1950s, Charlie Parker, Count Basie, Louis Armstrong, Miles Davis, dozens more. And I put together a, a Morgan Stern collection, which is on a, a co-sponsored Texas State NEA research website and it's on the university so on the basis of that then a year later Rutgers named me an external research scholar and what I got to do and this was I, I'll never forget this this is like 10 days before COVID broke out in New York City I'm at Rutgers and I'm going through these boxes of uncatalogued Dan Morgenstern memorabilia basically when he left he walked out of his office and they went in and boxed his entire office up into 60 boxes and stuck it in a closet. So nobody's ever looked at that. So I got to go through that and I maybe only got through 20% of it. But in that box were all kinds of beautiful things. There were videos from 50 years ago of a PBS series he produced in Chicago called Just Jazz. And I have those on my YouTube artist channel, all of them. There were broadcast tapes of the only known TV appearance of jazz tenor saxophonist Gene Ammons. There was the last televised appearance of Dexter Gordon. The only time any, any time on US TV by a, a concert by expatriate jazz tenorist John Bias. So that's all there. And then it, just in this past, you're talking 2020. So just in this past April, I completed more research from there, and that included, well, I was digging around in this box, and there's this tape that said Cosby. So I listened to it, 
and it's an interview with Cosby in uh, 1986 talking about his friendship with Miles Davis. So it's an interview, but Cosby relives at b being in Philadelphia in high school when Miles was like the coolest cat around. He, everybody knew every record of his, every recording, his band members, how he dressed and walked and talked. Everybody wanted to emulate Miles Davis because he was the coolest guy around. And then he was really astonished that eventually he became best friends with Miles. So I've released that tape and it's on my YouTube channel. But I held back releasing that because over the past two years, there's been this big controversy about Cosby. But back in 86, there was none of that. He was like a TV superstar with his show. And he hosted Miles Davis' wedding to Cecily Tyson in Beverly Hills. And it's just a great explanation of the myth mystique that, that Miles Davis has, plus his enormous impact as a creator. So that's that. And then another thing I released was a thing called the history of jazz drums. And this has become phenomenal. It's a 32 episode series of 1989 radio interviews between Lauren Schoenberg, who's the senior scholar at the National Jazz Museum in Harlem, but He's also very closely connected to Texas State because for the last 10 years, he's been the keynote speaker at our Texas State Eddie Durham celebration. And if you don't know who Eddie Durham is, he is from San Marcos. He's possibly the most famous Texas jazz musician. He wrote a lot of Count Basie's music. He arranged In the Mood and He's just super big writer, well-known. So during those concerts, Lauren Schoenberg would do a keynote speech about it. But he was also a radio interviewer like yourself, and he interviewed the great jazz drummer, Mel Lewis. And they, over 32 episodes of hours long each, they discussed techniques, equipment, the ensembles of 28 different jazz drummers from the very earliest days in jazz. There's a guy named Baby Dodds from 1918 to Buddy Rich, maybe you know that name, to modern drummers like Roy Haynes and Elvin Jones. And these interviews have just had a huge response all over the world from the drum community. And thanks for making them available. And it's a one of a kind series on my channel. That's the second thing. And the last thing I did that came out in April was the Jerry Goldsmith film retrospective. So since I teach jazz composition, I've always had an interest in film scores too, because there's a, a lot of jazz elements in, in film. This was a collaboration of a record label called Veres Sarabande, and then a radio show called XM Serious Cinemagic, which has gone off the air since then. Plus, it, it involved all the world orchestras, musicians, film studios, record labels. They all worked together with XM Serious to put this retrospective together on Jerry Goldsmith and his extraordinary music legacy. There's 205 episodes. So this was a chunk of work. It was a radio show that celebrated his 80th posthumous birthday. And it was originally broadcast as a five-day marathon of his acclaimed film and television scores. So let me just name some movies that we've all seen. He did Planet of the Apes, Twilight Zone, Alien, which I really love. The Omen, which won the Oscar, all the three Rambo trilogies, Star Trek, Poltergeist, Papillon, the original one with Steve McQueen, MacArthur, Chinatown, which is an amazing movie, Basic Instinct, we all remember that one, and Patton, and the list was endless. He wrote his entire life, he wrote mainly all of the, all the films we've ever seen. And at one of the Academy Awards, there was a fellow LA film composer, Henry Mancini, and I, I've got a quote of his. He said at the Academy Awards, he said, Goldsmith has instilled two things in his colleagues in this town. One thing he does is he keeps us honest. And the second one is he scares the hell out of us. So, so I love all that stuff because if you just have the moment to put your headphones on and, and look through that list and say, oh, yeah, I'd like to see, listen to that Rambo thing. And you listen to it for 10 minutes, you go, that's incredibly creative music with an orchestra. I have to say I got the permissions to put all of those on YouTube was, was a nightmare. 
but I got all the licenses. And if you go down while you're looking at it, you'll see all the licenses are, are presented there. So it's legal. Like I said, I, I mean, it's like five days worth of stuff. So you can just start and take a break and come back and listen to some more. He did mysteries, thrillers, psychological horror movies, war films, science fiction, fantasy, just everything. You remember Total Recall with Arnold Schwarzenegger? Oh, he did course. that. So I just love having been able to get that out there. That was in April. And so this summer, though, I'm in a pianist in a band called Times 10. And we've been playing for 15 years. It's a 10-piece group with all original music. But I just joined forces with a colleague of mine who I've been playing with for 50 years, John Mills, who's a jazz composition professor at UT. And we started a new quartet called Double Vision. And that highlights all our own original music. We're playing this Friday at the Elephant Club from nine to one. And we play at least once every month. There's four guys that can play anything. And that's kind of the stuff I write is, is, is very modern jazz. When you look back at your time at Texas State, what stands out to you in terms of being most memorable or most impactful for you, be it a, a performance, a student performance, research that you've conducted? The thing I did for uh, the Dan Morgenstern collection took a couple of years to put together. And I went back to when he was a college student and followed everything he did, the all of the friends he did had made. He he arrived in New York City in 1947 at the heyday of jazz and was too young to get into these bars to go hear these jazz musicians. So he just hang out outside. And his career just maximized the golden era of jazz. He was like the editor of the premier mag jazz magazine, Downbeat magazine for the 15 years. And he's just a walking encyclopedia. And I, I researched and produced videos of his friendships. There's 148 record reviews that he put together. There's searchable PDFs with an album cover and the music. He got eight Grammys. For, nobody knows this, but you can get a Grammy for writing record album liner notes. And he has eight of, eight of them. He's also been an advisor for dozens of films that include anything about that. So that was that's one aspect of that. I would also say that I've just been really proud of uh, over the years of, of past students of mine and what they've gone on to do. I think it's been 15 years, but there's a guy that's named Colonel Leo Pena, and he's been a director of the Army Band in Washington, D.C. for years, and he's played for the last three presidents. I've got a a recent student, Dane Relaford, and he's part of the opening act for the biggest Turing name in jazz these days, Christian McBride. Another graduate student of mine, David Mesquitik, just got back from Europe with a band called Postmodern Jukebox, and he plays all over. He just played a sold out show with Aubrey Logan at the Parker Jazz Club in Austin. And the other nice thing is how many international students have come to study with me. I've had a student from China and a current one from South Korea, a girl from Serbia, several students from Chile. I have two Latin students that are Latin piano graduate students. They're both from Colombia and Cuba. And I've also got a guy that just undergraduate degree from Berkeley and he's coming to study with his master's. So there's your world encompassing all around Texas State. It's all these people are coming here. I'm very proud to say they've read about me and they want to learn something from me. So I've got to give them something good. Looking back on all you've done, if you had the chance, the ability to, to talk to that three-year-old boy who could barely see over the keys, <laughs> what would you say about your life in music from your professional and the academic end? What would you tell that little boy? Take more chances. Definitely don't be afraid to fail and to learn from your mistakes. And Get out there more often. You've got to be able to make friends as well as the other thing I would say is get yourself recordings of yourself early on. I didn't record stuff of myself throughout the 20s and into the 30s of my age. So there's a lot of stuff I wish that I had recorded. So making recordings is one big thing and 
playing with lots of different people, different bands. You may not end up being a jazz musician, but maybe you're a studio musician that's uh, making records with other people or going on tour with someone. And always find out what's creative and try to seek variety in what you're doing. So you mentioned the, the bands that you play with now, uh, that you have a gig coming up not long from now. What's next for you? What else is on the horizon professionally, academically that, that you have coming up? Anything that you'd like to tell people about? Well, I received a McDowell 12 years ago. Uh, I'm the only person at Texas State, I believe, that ever got a McDowell. It's an artist award. And then the next year, I, they gave me an, another award based on what my writings are. So I'm currently submitting three of these tunes that I've just finished writing over the past couple months and to see if I can go back there because that's an amazing experience. Many times artists feel like they're isolated. They don't know who to talk to about what they work on. And so when I was at the McDowell, you're, you're in this artist colony that's world renowned and the oldest one in, in the world. You encounter all kinds of different artists and we all have dinner together. <laughs> I was there for six weeks and there could be a sculptor from Tibet and a painter from Brazil and everybody's got these things they worry about on, and they also want to talk about. We reach common ground and find out that that creative impetus is worldwide among certain people and it helped to really foster uh, myself getting out there more when I kind of came back. That's what started my research and and all my recent writing over the past 10 years. So I'm, I'm applying for that in September to see if I can go next summer. Well, best of luck on that. Sounds Thanks. like a wonderful, a wonderful experience to, to meet all those folks from different aspects of art and, and discuss what mm -hmm. creativity is all about for them, which is always, always a fun thing to talk about how others are inspired. So before we go here, you've mentioned it a couple times, your website, your YouTube channel, I'll give you an opportunity to let people know about them. Where, where can they go to find them? What's the address? And so they can listen to some of the stuff that you have. Yeah, right. So if you go to YouTube and type in and spell my name correctly, H-E-H-M-S-O-T-H, -H -S it'll pop up. That's my artist channel. And gosh, everything is there. The Just Jazz videos, a lot of the Dan Morgenstern collection, uh, the interview with Bill Cosby about Miles Davis, the entire movie collection of Jerry Goldsmith, the 32 episodes of history. Of, I mean, that's the primary place, really. And then you can go check my bio here on at Texas State, too. But that's just words. There's a lot of videos on that YouTube channel. I think there's almost 500 videos. That's pretty prolific for a YouTube <laughs> channel. That, that's excellent. Hank Hemsoff, thank you so much for joining us with Big Ideas. Thank you, Dan. And thank you all for downloading and listening to another episode of Big Ideas. We'll be back in September with another episode. And until then, stay well and stay informed. Big Ideas TXST is a presentation of Texas State University and the Division of University Advancement. Subscribe to experience more innovative, thought-provoking content. If you like what you hear, consider leaving us a starred review, five if possible. The views expressed during this program are those of the individual participants and do not necessarily represent those of the university. Big Ideas is hosted by Daniel Seed, produced by Jamie Bloschke. Strategic consultant is Kelly Raz. 